The Montreal Canadiens drafted him in the third round of the 1987 draft. Can you say power forward? He scored two overtime winners in game three and game four of the Stanley Cup final in 1993. He was traded in 1995. He formed the Legion of Doom line with Eric Lindros and Mikael Renberg. He played with some of the greatest players to ever play the game. He was the first American to score 50 goals three years in a row. The great John LeClaire coming up. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast with Tony Maradero. The Sickest Montreal Canadiens Podcast. And now a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup. Sports entertainment like no other. Brought to you by 8.6 Beer. Intense by nature. And Lacage. If the last time you went to Lacage was when the Habs won the Cup, it's time you went back to Lacage. The menu will surprise you. That's right. The Sick Podcast brought to you by 8.6 Beer. Intense by nature. The beers for those who follow their instinct and live their passions in order to make their mark. And Lacage. If the last time you went to Lacage was when the Habs won the Cup, it's time you go back to Lacage. The menu will surprise you. I can tell you that I went last night at their beautiful location in Villa Sal, and I'm not surprised by the menu because I've been several times and the steak was absolutely fantastic. Speaking of, the last time the Canadians won the Stanley Cup, that was back in 1993. And one guy who was on that team, as a matter of fact, he was a catalyst. John LeClaire, how are you? Doing great. How are you guys today? I'm doing extremely well. Thanks for doing this, John. It's good to see you. Yeah, it's good to be here. Appreciate it. Um, born in, in St. Albans, Vermont, if memory serves me well. Um, where is home for John LeClaire today? Uh, yeah, I grew up in St. Albans, about an hour from Montreal. Uh, but uh, when I came here to Philly, we spent a lot of our years here. The kids were born here and grew up here. And uh, the wife and I and the kids, we ended up staying after my play playing career was over. Oh, that's kind of cool. John, I, I know you're involved with Three Ice, uh, and I'm really looking forward to this. It was supposed to have happened by now, but of course, uh, COVID threw a little bit of, uh, uh, of, a, of a dent in it. But the inaugural season is going to start in June. It's uh, three on three hockey. And there's going to be eight events that are going to take place in Las Vegas, Denver, Grand Rapids, Hershey, London, Ontario, Pittsburgh, Quebec City, and Nashville. And there are eight Hall of Fame coaches, one of which is John LeClaire. Yeah, I'm excited to be part of that. Um, we were all set, ready to go last summer. Uh, but with all the uncertainty of the buildings and things like that, I think they made a great decision and uh you know, so for two years here, we've been looking to kick this off, and everybody's really excited. Um, I think the fans are going to absolutely love it. It's uh, three-on-three hockey, high pace, no whistles, just uh, kind of get up and go. And it, the talent on the ice is going to be incredible. Um, you know, we're getting all pro professional players, guys that are in the A, playing over in Europe, uh, top-notch college kids that are looking for a free agency stuff. So uh, the skill level is going to be out of the charts, off the charts. And uh, it's just going to be exciting, really exciting to watch. John, do you coach? Uh, I've coached a little bit here and there with my kids growing up and, and things like that. And, I mean, isn't everybody that watches a game a coach? I mean, they uh, I would have done this. I would have done that every time I watch a game with my buddies. So, um, you know, I, I, I've been uh, around the game enough. I feel very confident that I'll uh, be able to coach these guys and, uh, and hopefully be successful. I think I, I want our team to be in Vegas at the end. John, I know hockey is uh, is five on five, but I have to tell you, the more I watch three on three, I just I'm a big fan of the game, and I'm so excited about this league, Three Ice. And to find out more about it, by the way, you can go to threeice.com. You know, last night we had a chance to watch the Montreal Canadiens uh, play the Flames in Calgary, and the game went to three on three overtime. And you have two on ones, you have odd man rushes, you have all that open ice, you have so many young players, you have a lot of skill, and for those who have speed and skill it's an opportunity for you to really showcase what you got. And this is what this league is going to be able to do. And, and that's what we're hoping for. Right? You know, ever since uh, the NHL went to that three on three overtime, um, the buzz has been nothing but positive. People love it. They love the excitement. They love the scoring chances. Um, and that's what we want to grab. Um, you know, EJ Johnson did a great job of, of grabbing that feeling and then, you know, try, try to tweak a few little things to keep the game moving. 
Um, you know, we're going to try to limit the face-offs. We want to do just some certain things like the puck goes in the netting. We're going to keep playing. Uh, you know, if there's a goal, just going to take it out from behind the net. So it's bang, bang, bang. It's going to be action all the time. But uh, that's what you want. You want those scoring chances. You want those action, you know, pack games going back and up and down the ice. And uh, that's what you see a lot. Like you saw, you know, obviously with the Calgary-Montreal game last night. EJ Johnston, who's the founder of the league, uh, gave me a little something on you, which I'm going to get back to a little later on, okay? But uh, if you can, I I'd love to revisit your career, John, if we can, because it was obviously such an awesome career. A third-round pick by the Montreal Canadiens in 1987. At what point did John LeClaire think, I'm going to be an NHLer? There's no doubt about it. <laughs> uh, it took a while, um, you know. Uh, when I played college at Vermont, I just, I didn't really have that much, am, not ambition, but I didn't really look that far ahead. Truthfully, I was hurt a little bit in college between a knee injury and a Charlie horse. Um, and then when I, I had my chance my senior year to cut called up, uh, it, it felt like a little bit of a dream. You know, it was everything happened so fast, those last 10 games and then the two rounds of the playoffs that I played. Um, when I came back to camp the next year and started that season um, with the Canadians and in and out of the lineup and stuff like that, that's when the doubt comes in and you start wondering, you know, can I make it in this league? And then, you know, uh, had a tough year, my, my full rookie year. And then after that, uh, Jacques came in and, um, you know, I got to play with some different players and uh, things really started to take off for me there. And I just, then I kind of felt like I belonged. John, I don't have to tell you how seriously some people take hockey, especially hockey parents and stuff like that. But there are kids um, who don't make the triple A team. They don't make the highest level and, and everyone's demoralized. Uh, it's not the end of the world, right? You didn't always make the most competitive team growing up. Um, no, I mean, uh, my freshman year in high school, I got cut from my high school team, you know. Um, but it was different back then. There was never pressure that I had to play in the NHL and things like that. I think, you know, kids today, they put a little bit too much pressure on themselves. I mean, you know, the real reason we played hockey is because we loved it. I mean, it wasn't about, yeah, you wanted to be in the NHL. It was a dream and that kind of stuff. But you played because you loved it and, you know, and that was why you played the game. It wasn't about, I need a scholarship or I need to, you know, I got to get to, I'm going to play pro hockey kind of things. Those are kind of dream things and, and you did it for the love of it. And I think that's why you found those guys just love playing so much. It just, they got there because, because of the love of the game. And today when I see some of these kids that they're very talented, but I just don't see the love of the game that I saw with some of the other younger guys. What advice would you give the young generation playing hockey? I would just say don't lose that enjoyment aspect of it. It can't be a job when you're playing youth hockey. It's got to be entertainment and fun, being with your buddies. And, and you know, if, if you want to improve, because obviously the better you are, probably the more fun you're going to have because you can do more things, um, then put that work in. I mean, you know, it's not so much the weight room. It's, you know, guys shooting pucks in the yard and, and doing those kind of things and just, uh, you know, always trying to get yourself better what you can uh, when you have some spare time. You uh, you came up in the 1990-91 season, and then you played most of the – you remember your first NHL game? Oh, yeah. Uh, Saturday Night Hockey Night in Canada against Vancouver. Scored in your first game, did you not? I did. I, uh, I was able to get one. Uh, it wasn't the prettiest of goals. It was a little bit lucky, but uh, you know what? It counts, and uh, I'll never forget it. You score that goal in your first NHL game. You score your first NHL goal. What are the first things you're thinking about? just, I, I can't, like, it was wondering if it's real kind of thing. It was, you know, um, two days before that, I was sitting in my college apartment, um, you know, and now I'm playing, you know, in the Montreal Forum, um, you know, and obviously I grew up watching Hockey Night in Canada. I, I know the history behind the Forum and just the whole the whole thing was surreal. You play for Jacques Demers with the Montreal Canadiens, and um, you said he kind of took a liking to you, and I remember that year that you won the Stanley Cup, and we'll get to that, of course, uh, that year that you won, I'm sure you remember this, John, but correct me if I'm wrong, in preseason, didn't Jacques not like the way you guys were working and called for a 7 a.m. practice and everyone had to be at the rink at 6 o'clock in the morning? Yeah, yeah, Jacques, um, Jacques was a good motivator like that. Uh, that was one of Jacques' real strong points. Uh, he had a good feel for people and for the team, and uh, yeah, he wasn't happy with things, so uh, he got us out of bed pretty early the next day. You had, uh, you had Pat Burns before you had Jacques, but talk to me about Jacques, who that year in 93 said he really wanted to, 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 to bring the team together, and obviously he did. You guys won 
the Stanley Cup, but what was it about him as a coach? Uh, was it really, like you just said, he was a great motivator more than anything else? Yeah, to me, when, you know, I think of Jacques, it just what a great people person he was. Uh, enjoyed talking to people, enjoyed getting to know people. And he was good at reading situations like that. He knew if a guy was in a slump, kind of if he needed to be pressed a little bit or if he needed to lay off the guy kind of stuff. Uh, I thought he handled that kind of stuff very well. And, uh, you know, he was good at bringing the team together. He really wanted one group, and that meant all 25 of us or how many it was. Uh, we were all one, and there's no outsiders whatsoever. John, if memory serves me well, and I think I remember a thing or two because I was uh, 20 years old uh, when you guys won the Cup in 1993, 20 or 21. And um, and um, I remember it like it was yesterday because I was a big fan, obviously. But that series versus the Nordiques, I, if memory serves me well, the last month and a half of the season, John, I think your team was in first place. Then Patrick Waugh wasn't playing his best hockey you end up finishing third in the division and you end up playing the Nordiques in the first round and, and everyone in Montreal is like, no, uh, please tell me they're not going to lose versus the Nordiques. And you lose the first two games of that series. Uh, how much doubt set in with the last month and a half of the season that you guys went from first in the division to third and now you lose the first two games versus Quebec? You know, it's a long time ago, but my recollection is there was none. I mean, I, you know, I yeah. do remember that that uh, game three because when we went up there, uh, guys were loose. Uh, you know, we had some great veterans on our team, like Carbo. Um, you know, they brought in Rob Ramage and Patrick. When Patrick spoke and when he got involved, people listened and it was a great leader. Um, you know, we we had guys there that have been there and weren't they weren't rattled at all. Um, so it it was just hey, they won those two. Uh, we got to grab two up here. And um, there was no panic. I remember there was just, there was no, no panic, no worry. Um, it was, we had a good feeling about where we were headed still. And uh, I remember game six, Paul DiPietro scores three goals. Yeah. In game six, huh? Uh, played the yeah. game of his life in that one. So you beat the Nordiques. Uh, you make easy work out of the Buffalo Sabres. Uh, you sweep them. And then you're playing the New York Islanders who had beat the Pittsburgh Penguins. The Penguins had won the Cup in 91. They had won the Cup in 92. And then they lose out in the first round to the New York Islanders in Game 7. David Volek scores the overtime winner. When you saw the Islanders eliminate the Penguins, and you move on, you beat the Nordiques, you, meet the Buffalo, you beat the Buffalo Sabres, the Penguins aren't there anymore. Are you thinking it's our Cup? Um, we had a good feeling when, when, when the Islanders won that game in overtime, there was a loud roar in our hotel room that year, that day, um, the whole hall, you could see guys were a little excited. I mean, obviously back then Pittsburgh was a wagon. Those guys were, they had, they were a talented group. Um, I still think we could have beat Pittsburgh. I really do. We were playing that well. Um, and I think we could have beaten them. No problem. Not no problem, but I mean, I think we could have beaten them. Um, but obviously I think the Islanders were a better matchup for us. And, uh, you know, it worked out pretty well. Um, you know, that for game one against that series in the conference final, I remember pretty well because you could just see how drained the Islanders were from that series before with Pittsburgh going to overtime. And then two days later, they're playing in the Montreal Forum in an afternoon game. So, uh, you know, it was nice to get the, the head start on them there. And then, uh, you know, like I said, we had a pretty good confidence as a group, uh, you know, getting to that point as it was. Uh, so it doesn't take much for that confidence to keep rolling. And uh, you, you did you, okay. You, we yeah. beat them in five, so it wasn't yeah. great. You beat the Islanders in five. You make it to the Stanley Cup final against Wayne Gretzky and the Los Angeles Kings. At the Forum in Montreal, Gretzky uh, and company win. I believe 4-1 was game one. At that point, I know you talked about no panic when you were down 2 nothing to Quebec, and you talked about no panic up until that point. But Los Angeles comes into your building in the Stanley Cup final and they beat you game one rather convincingly. At that point, is there someone who stands up? Because I, I think Carboneau told Jacques Demers, give me the Gretzky assignment and set Muller free. Did he not? He did. And, you know, you, know, you only get to the Stanley Cup finals how many times. Like, you got to take advantage of it. You can't let, you know, every moment, every shift counts. And, uh, you know, after losing game one, uh, there wasn't a panic, but there was a, there was an acknowledgement that uh, this is an important game here. We got we got to win. And we made some tweaks between game one and game two. Um, 
they helped. Uh, I think they helped in the long run more than they dealt immediately as we, we still struggled to win game two, as you probably re remember Eric Bajardin with the, you know, the last minute goal and then the overtime goal. So yeah, um, it wasn't, it wasn't like we, you know, fixed it and the switch went off and we're winning three, one, five, one, that kind of thing. So, um, but it was, it was good. Uh, it was those, like I said, those little tweaks uh, to take advantage of where you are at that time. Uh, it made a world of difference. I remember Desjardins has a goal. You're down to one. He scores in the final minute, ties it at two. But that goal happens because you guys are on the power play because Jacques Demers calls for uh, Marty McSorley with an illegal curve. John, what was the intel on that? How did that go down? Come on. it's a, This is like the, the, the caramel bar. It's the best kept secret. You got to tell me. It is. And I, I hate to kind of be the Debbie Downer to the drama and stuff, but I mean, back then, guys in the league, everybody knew who had a stick and who didn't have a stick. They knew if it was illegal or not. I mean, it's just Vin, Vin, Vincent Danfus had a stick that you could tie a knot with it. I think the curve was so illegal. But Vinny was smart enough. He had an X on a backup stick. So if we were up by a goal, you know, the last five minutes of the third, you know, tell the trainer, go get me the X, and he'd go and play with a legal stick. Um, you know, that stuff, that was just kind of known throughout the league and stuff like that, who had a bad stick and who didn't. And, uh, you know, all this conspiracy stuff, like the trainer was over there measuring on the morning skate and all that kind of crap. I, you know, I don't buy any of that. If it happened, I was oblivious to it. I tell you that, too. Back then, Barry Melrose said, I don't believe in winning that way. Remember that? Yeah, well, because he lost. But if Barry won that way, he wouldn't have been saying that. So, you know, you got to take from where the criticism coming from. All right. So now you go back. You go to Los Angeles. The series is tied at one. The game goes to overtime. Game three, this happens. We'll pick it up and come out for Montreal, out to center. Long shot by Bellows, didn't get too far. Here's the chance for the Oh, and a roll by the open side. He got another crack at it. He scores. The Canadians win the game in overtime again. I'm sure you never get tired of seeing that. Yeah, no, you don't. Um, you know, it's obviously a, a big moment in my career, but... Uh, you know, every time I see it, I'm like, why didn't I put the first one in? I had plenty of room on the far side low. I just, I don't know what I was thinking. But you got a couple of cracks at it there. It looked like everyone was down and out. I did. Goal scoring wasn't that easy for me yeah. it's, um, at that point. Um, you know, not that it was ever easy. But, uh, yeah, you know, I had the initial shot, got the rebound. Yeah, that didn't work. And then finally, third time was a charm. Uh, and that gave you so much confidence that the next game you said, hey, this is fun. Let's go out there and let's do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Montreal, Leclerc coming in, that's it, he's in there, and Kent and Shaw really get it on 20 counts, they score, the Canadians score, win the game, another overtime victory for the Canadians. I think you banked it in off Daryl Sador, did you not? I did, so, you know, my two overtime goals, you know, I, I needed some luck, so, but, uh, you know, luck helps. Uh, I was really actually trying to get that puck over to LeBeau. That's why I wanted to pull a goalie out with the fake. And then, but uh, so door went down. And uh, in the long run, it turned out I'm glad he went down because he was sliding the net and took the puck with him. Stefan LeBeau was such an underrated player, by the way. I think he scored like 28 goals or whatever it was that year. But he had a big year that year he won the cup and also scored a goal in, the, in game five in the cup final. I mean, LeBeau, Steph was one of the more talented guys I've seen. I and mean, he had unbelievable hands, really smart with the puck, very, very gifted offensively, really good player. You score those goals. Uh, and I know it's a long time ago, but uh, how many people are calling you and stuff like that and whatever? How many people were excited and, and telling you you're one win away from winning the Stanley Cup and stuff like that? Can you remember some of the calls that you were getting and, 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 and the way it went down? Yeah, I mean – it was more my answer machine when I, we got back to Montreal, that kind of thing. But uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm that old. Uh, cell phones weren't a blue, like they are today. Back yeah. Then. A few people had them, this and that. So, um, but yeah, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of excitement, um, you know, family and friends, obviously very excited. So um, it, it was a big moment, obviously, in my career at that time. Did you have family show up for game five at the Montreal Forum? Uh, yeah, my mom and dad uh, came up for the game. And uh, then I had some buddies that came up also. Um, so, uh, yeah, we had some family. In my parents, The other family came for the parade. But, uh, yeah, my mom and dad were there. And, like I said, some buddies came up too. John, I would imagine that when you're a player uh, and every time you play a game, you, you, you probably think you're going to win the game. 
but going into that game five, uh, was there nerves? I mean, you, you, you can sense it, you can feel it. Everyone wanted the big party to happen, but how nervous were you that if it doesn't happen and you got to go back to LA? It, it's a fear. It, it, there's a fear that we go back there and then who knows what can happen. So uh, there was a little bit of a, a fear still in you. Um, I don't think anybody was celebrating just yet. We knew uh, we, we had some work to do. So I think that was the best thing about the nine frame going into game five. But, you know, I was young back then. It was, my mind was everywhere. You know, you got people that want to come up for the, you know, the game and trying to like work all that stuff out. Uh, uh, you know, I was, I was happy to get on the ice and get rid of all that other stuff. Was there somebody who stood up before the game and said, uh, just to calm everyone down or on the other hand, to pump everybody up? Was there, was there one player in particular or was it Jacques Demers or? I don't really remember a, a guy jumping up saying, you know, this is our moment kind of thing. Um, you know, I just, Jock's whole tone through everything was, you know, guys grab every opportunity. We have a, there's no bigger opportunity than the one here in game five. Um, you know, that it was kind of enough said. I, nothing sticks out to me. Um, you know, there must have been some little things here and there. Obviously, we had those kind of leaders on the team, but uh, there wasn't one moment that sticks out. If you want to get a Montreal Canadiens jersey and put number 17 on it for John LeClaire, you can do so at sportbuffshop.com for all of your officially licensed sports apparel and our sick merchandise and use code 615 for 15% off on all of their items and a shout out to matrixhomefitness.ca. Bring it home, discover a club quality workout in the comfort of your own home. Visit matrixhomefitness.ca. So John, you win the Stanley Cup, the parade, a million people downtown Montreal. How cool was that? That was the best part. You know, obviously there's so many great parts to win the Stanley Cup, but uh, the parade is very high on my list. It's, probably, you know, one of the favorite things about it. Um, just everybody celebrating, you know, the Maison Oof was just packed. It was just, it was the best. A year and a half later, the Canadians get out to a bad start. I think it was an 0-5 start. Jacques Demers is relieved of his duties. A new coach comes in, Mario Tremblay. Several months later, in the month of February, you're traded as the Canadians are trying to turn things around along with Eric Desjardins and Gilbert Delorme. Uh, pardon me, Gilbert Dion, pardon me. You get traded for Mark Recchi. And then you go to Philadelphia, and it's the Legion of Doom. Eric Lindros, Mikael Renberg, John LeClaire. I know you were sad to leave Montreal, John, but Philadelphia was so great for your career, huh? It, it really was. It turned out uh, to be uh, you know, kind of a little bit of a blessing for me. Um, nothing against playing in Montreal, you know, playing for that organization was great, but, um, you know, having a chance to play with Eric, the chemistry Eric and uh, Rennie and I had, uh, it was tremendous to be a part of. 50 goal seasons, 51 in Philadelphia, 50 the next year, 51 the next year, then 43 and then 40, but you became the first American player to score 50 plus three years in a row. I mean, did you realize when you did that then that you were becoming the first American-born player to score 50-plus three years in a row? I mean, that's that's pretty amazing when you think about it. Um, I was surprised more than anything. I thought there would have been a Joey Mullen or a Brett Hall or one of those guys, you know, through the ways would have done that. So uh, when somebody pointed it, didn't really know about it until after it was over and somebody pointed that out to me kind of thing. Um, I guess – is known for something like that. I'll, I'll take that any day, um, especially with some of the company. Like I said, the, those goal scoring Americans, like those guys, I, I thought maybe. But um, you know, from right now, we'll, we'll see how long. Uh, there's a couple Americans lighting it up pretty good these days. Talk to me about that line. When was the first time that line was put together? Do you remember it? And it just it just took off. Yeah, um, well, I got traded. They had a game that morning. Uh, I got traded the morning. They had a game that night. So, uh, you know, Eric and uh, Bertie and I, we all made it down there in time to get to the, play that game. Uh, and I played with Eric and Michael that uh, that night. Um, things didn't go great. Uh, just there was just everything was off. We didn't really do anything. Um, but he kept us together. And then we had a Saturday. We played in uh, a Saturday afternoon game in uh, New Jersey. And uh, it just clicked um, from the drop of the puck of that game. Things just clicked. And, and from there, it just uh, kind of grew and grew. You had a chance to play for so many coaches. Uh, I'm going to try and remember them. Uh, Pat Burns. Yep. Jacques Demers. Mario Tremblay. I did not play for Mario. I was out oh. before that all happened. Oh, you didn't play for Mario. Okay. Um, was there uh, Wayne Cashman? 
Cash was in Philly, yeah. Terry Murray? Yeah. Ken Hitchcock? You played for, um, I'm not sure if there's another coach. Uh, you played for Ed Olchek? Yep. You played for Roger Nielsen? Yep. And you played for Michel Therrien? I did. Am I missing somebody? It would be a quick intern. No, the one people forget is Cash. Cash, nobody really, you were good with the coaches. Well, I, I had I had looked up your career a long time ago type of yeah. thing. I just, you know, but yeah, uh, I, but I, I remember that one. Uh, everybody in Montreal remembers the Leclerc trade and for Recky and stuff like that and the rest of your career and the rest of his career. And it's well, funny I mean, because you guys ended up playing together in the end. We did. And <laughs> Rex had himself a pretty fine career. Let's not feel yeah. sorry for Rex's career whatsoever. Um I think it was timing's everything. Uh, when they traded Eric Gilbert and I, um, that was the start of the things that started going. Like you mentioned later on, like a month or two later, then the, you know, the incident happened with with Patrick and all that yeah. stuff. So, um, you know, that, that was kind of the start of things. And um, you know, it just it makes a trade seem loom bigger because things went a little bit more downhill. But I think. I don't know if it was all based on one trade. That's all. I'm all right. So you brought me back to the whole Patrick situation. So let's go there now, if we can. Um, just relive that moment uh, with me, if you can. And when, as the game's going, so hold on a second. You were gone. That was Maritron. You were gone I already. I wasn't here when that happened. So anyway, you you see that happen. Patrick Waugh moves on. Uh, he's traded. You're in Philly. You're thinking what? Patrick Waugh just got traded. I'm thinking, uh, you know, they said Gretzky gets traded. I guess they were, you know, that, that's that is something true. Um, I, I couldn't believe it though. It, it was it was shock. It, it was absolute shock. Um, but I, like I said, when I read the, I was shocked after the incident. Not when he got traded. After the incident, when Patrick said, "I'll never put the jersey on," just because knowing Patrick is Patrick doesn't just say things. And yeah, he wouldn't have said that. So he was getting traded. So for him, that's when I, the shock was that. I can't imagine Patrick in other than a Canadian's uniform kind of thing. You obviously had the luxury of playing for him, but for you, everyone talks about the greatest goalie of all time. Was it Patrick? To me, it was. I mean, uh, to see the way he competed, um, his the results he got, just how talented and how good he was for his time in the area. He was head and shoulders above others. Um, there's not a guy for one game that I wouldn't put in other than Patrick. We talked about all the guys that had the opportunity to coach you. Who's the one you enjoyed playing for the most? Now, now, now the questioning gets a little bit more difficult here. So who I like playing for? Yeah. Um, when I first came to Philly, uh, Terry Murray played the hell out of me. He even tried to let me kill penalties. Like I, he, and I was playing, I went from, you know, an average good 13, 15 minutes. It's fine. You know, I'm playing 20 plus and uh, it just, it was, it was awesome. Is there a coach that maybe you didn't hate playing for, but you probably enjoyed the least? Oh, who I enjoyed the least? Yeah. That's tough. Um, you know, I didn't enjoy playing for Darian at all. And uh, I didn't like playing for Hitch, but I was just for other reasons, not because of hockey. Hitch is a hockey coach. is very smart and a very good coach. Um, but there was other things that I didn't like playing for Hitch for. I got it. All right. Okay. Um, your your career. Now you end up. It's it's incredible because you're on a Legion of Dune line with uh, with uh, Eric Lindros and Mikael Renberg. Uh, is is there one Lindros story that you can share with me today, right here on the Sick Podcast? Uh, I mean, there's many, you know. But to me, the biggest thing watching Eric watching that stuff firsthand was just it's awesome. But uh, you know, the way the guy practiced was. He played. He practiced just as intense as he played, and uh, so when we had to, to practice, we had to be on. And um, you know, I, I remember one day, I just you know, it was practice, and just maybe my head wasn't into it. But I had a couple of drills where it just passes her off and stuff like that. So he waits until Rennie gets right next to me, and he starts talking to Rennie like he like I'm not there. Like, can you believe this guy? You can't get a puck on the stick. This and that. <laughs> He, he wasn't trying to be sneaky. He absolutely knew I was trying to make like me hear it, but it was his way of saying, you know what? It's time to go. It's time to go. And, uh, and I like that. Eric. He pushed me, made me a better player like that. It was his way of trying to wake you up without telling you face to face. I just, just, 
It was, but it was, he was, like I said, I'm not trying to say he was trying to pull one out. He was trying face to face. He was absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's pretty funny actually, but you leave Philadelphia. There's some, there's a salary cap kicks in. You make your way to Pittsburgh and now you're playing on the same team as among others, Sidney Crosby, Mario Lemieux, I think for a little while, uh, Mark Andre Fleury, Christopher Latang, um, Afghani Malkin. Yeah. Mark Recchi, pretty good yeah. players. They are. The only problem is half is way up here and the other half is way down here as far as the age goes. You know, we got all those guys in their first year. Those those are all their first year. Yeah. Six first year. Malkin came in the year after. Fleury was there his first year when I got there. Um, and then, you know, Mario and Ziggy Felty. We had a lot of great veterans. Um, you know, just it was either too late or too early. Um, but, uh, yeah, we had some a lot of talent that went through Pittsburgh in those two years I was there. Yeah, I, you played at the University of Vermont for four years. A couple of years after you left there, Marty St. Louis played at the University of Vermont for four years. Yep. He was coaching his son's Bantam team, and he got hired as the Montreal Canadiens for their interim coach between now and the end of the season. He has them playing the best hockey they've played all season. When you heard that Marty St. Louis was hired by the Canadiens, to be their coach and his only experience really at the time was coaching his son's Bantam team. You thought what? Well, I was surprised. I didn't know Marty was, you know, looking for a head coaching job, but uh, you know, it, it makes sense for him. I, I get the connection he has with some of the guys up here in, in Montreal. And uh, you know, obviously Marty knows a lot about hockey and uh you know, it doesn't. I don't know about the whole. Everybody's like, oh, he's coaching his Bantam team or whatever. I, I don't think that makes any difference whatsoever. I think, you know, some guys have that feel, and they know Marty's got that grasp of, of being a coach. So, you know, it's just. I don't think it was a big jump what they said. He knows the game well. He's been involved in the game enough, and uh, you know, to say that kind of stuff, I, I don't think that's going to be something that he's got to worry about. Um, so, EJ Johnston, the uh, the founder of Three Ice, told me. When I asked him about John LeClaire, he said, Tony, he's got such a great analytical mind and he's really got some uh, a bright hockey mind. He's going to be a really good coach in three ice. Marty St. Louis comes here and he talks about believing more in concepts than he does in systems. Uh, do you see Do you see it the same way? Yeah, I think um, you got to let talent express itself and get out there. I think... Um, you know, when you put things in certain up and down lines and areas to be and you know, it's too robotic. And uh, I think if you look back about five, six years ago, it was very robotic the way it went. And that's why the goal scoring was down. I think now when you see, you know, all this, like, you know, the Zegers stuff and all these guys between, you know, to choke between his legs and stuff like that, it allows them to be free. And that goes with the neutral zone. You know, when you get a chance, you know, you you're not stuck to your half or your quarter or wherever they want you to be on your ice. That if you want to loop back and get some speed or come in late, you know, those kind of things, it does open up things and allows people to express their talents. What advice with would an American kid like John LeClaire uh, give an American kid like Cole Caulfield, um, who, like John LeClaire, has only played eight games at the American Hockey League level, right? Uh, loves to score goals. What advice would you give him? Um, never get gun shy. I mean, the kid can rip a puck. He's got a talent. He's got a gift to uh, to be able to get it off his stick and find the opening. And and he's got to just trust his instinct. And uh, you know, you go three or four games about it. Don't make that extra pass in the power play. Let it go. You're not. The, he's not there to set anybody up. He's there to shoot the puck. And that's what he's got to. You always always have that gunner mentality. There's a lot of people that when they saw him, they said, this guy's going to get obliterated in the National Hockey League. He's way too small. Um, is it safe to say that in 2022, size probably more than ever doesn't matter? Uh, no. I mean, you know, look at these guys. Uh, it, it's talent. you got to have that talent, and that's first and foremost. Um, you know, I watched Minnesota play last night, and Zuccarello is not, you know, he's not an animal by any means. And, uh, you know, he's one of Minnesota's best players. Uh, it, it's all about talent and what you can do and what you can produce. And, you know, yeah, there's still hitting in the game and things like that, but there's not as much clutching and grabbing. And, and honestly, being the big, slow, tough guy, it's, it's not going to cut it in this NHL. 
Who's your favorite player in the league right now? Uh, I will absolutely tune in to watch McDavid play. Uh, the guy's amazing to me. What he can do at, full, at top-notch speed, which is even higher than guys just skating to catch him, uh, I find amazing. I know there's plenty of hockey to be played still, but who's going to win the Stanley Cup in your opinion? I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, it, I'm going to be wrong whenever I guess, but uh, there's there's a lot of great teams out there, um, and it's. I think when you get down to those last uh, four, it's going to be anybody's game, which is great. Uh, but if you ask me today, Colorado. When was the last time John Leclerc made it back to Montreal? I was in Montreal about three years ago, and uh, I loved it. Yeah, a lot of construction. You guys were still digging. I mean, I could have been 10 years, and I guess there would have been construction from what I hear. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was. Um, it's always great to go back. So I talked to you about Marty St. Louis, obviously the head coach of the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, and John LeClaire is going to be a head coach for 3ice.com, 3-on-3 hockey, which is going to start this summer. Uh, do you have plans bigger than that? Do you want to be part of an NHL franchise one day? Um, you know, my kids are out of college now, so I got some more time on my hands. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if that's something like that came up, I would obviously entertain something like that. But if not, um, you know, I'm kind of just – filling in the time with this three ice stuff. And it's been, it's been great. Uh, I'm looking forward to the three ice stuff growing and, and being a, a, a real respectable top notch league. Do you know Jeff Gordon, Kent Hughes, Marty St. Louis personally, any of them? I, uh, you know, I know those guys. Yeah, I know they are and you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, we met, know each other. Yeah. Hopefully it, uh, if you do make your way back in the game, you end up back in Montreal. Because That's John really LeClaire probably beat. should have never left the Montreal Canadiens, but you, like you said, it really did work out well for your career. It, it did, and uh, it's it's years I'll never forget playing and living there. John, in ending, do you have a message for Montrealers who are watching? <laughs> Hang in there, guys. Uh, you know, it's going to be a bit, but uh, it'll get there. It'll get there. You enjoyed Montreal as a city, did you not? Yes, absolutely. Montreal is a, a great city. Uh, people treated me uh, tremendous. And uh, obviously that tie with the, the 93 Cup, uh, it'll always be a favorite. And we'll never forget it, John. It's a part of our history as well. John LeClaire, you're a part of our history. 24 Stanley Cups and the game winner in Game 3 and Game 4 in the Stanley Cup Final. John, congratulations once again on an amazing career. Best of luck to you in your post-career and with three ice hockey. We look forward to seeing you. Maybe I'll come down when you're going to be in Quebec City. Absolutely. Come see us. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Great. Take care. There you have it, the great John LeClaire. It's a sick podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Sick Podcast and subscribe to our YouTube channel at The Sick Podcast. It's free, brought to you by 8.6 Beer and LaCash. Tell your friends about it. I'm telling you, this podcast is sick. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow The Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by 8.6, Intense by Nature, and Lakage. If the last time you went to Lakage was when the Habs won the cup, it's time you went back to Lakage. The menu will surprise you. <laughs>